All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Watch This With Dennis lunch live stream for October 27th, 2022. I obviously am Dennis, and it's been a little while, I guess, since I did a live stream. I think it's been about a week and a half, so not too, too long, but been pretty busy. Uh, the last uh, week in particular had a work conference that I needed to. I got to meet that. There we go. Um that I had to attend and I've been putting out a lot of videos, did a few shorts uh, recently. I think after it was the last live stream where I did, um, I think I'd already put out a review of the IWC Portuguese, but had not yet released the review of the Orient Cano, which came out, I think the day after I did that last live stream, which feels like an eternity ago to me because it was, <laughs> It was, uh, I actually pre-recorded so much of the footage for that. So, uh, and I say good afternoon as well to Kevin, enjoying uh, the much calmer weather now in Florida, hopefully. So today I have a few, uh, two, a few being two. I have two discussion items that I thought we would do just for a short, a short topic. And then of course, if there are people that end up live in the chat that want to talk about anything, we can go over other watch items. But I'm going to start with an Omega thing, which I think has gotten a lot of play, um, despite how expensive it is. So I don't know how practical it is for most people. And then I also want to talk a little bit about the Dragon Ball Z collection with Swatch. So we'll we'll take it back down to the much more affordable realm for folks. So let's go ahead and kick this over. And actually, I see I already have it up on the screen. I didn't. I forgot I already had uh, <laughs> I had it turned in. Uh, let me make me even smaller though. So. In terms of the Omegas, we've got a couple of items here that, uh, actually, let me bounce this over. I still have my, there we go. Didn't really, I didn't really need to do that. I wasn't showing anything, but I still have my work emails up and it's like, I'm on lunch. They need to not bug me. Um, so uh, Omega, they've put out a sort of grand complication watch, actually two watches. And uh, I do have a link in the description to the a blog to watch, but I've also got tabs open as you can see in the upper left. Uh, so we can actually go to Omega directly to discuss these, but they are, they call it the Speedmaster Chrono Tri Chi Chime, which is the one you can see on the screen right now. And they also have the Olympic 1932 Chrono Chime. So there are a couple of things that are true for both of these watches. Well, there are more than a couple because uh, one, they're all really, really expensive, but I wasn't going to open with that. In terms of the complications, there are two things going on with these watches that I think are, are pretty interesting. And this is the picture of the uh, 1932. Um, we'll have better shots later as we move along. But so these uh, these are both chronographs. They're, they're, they're um, I guess, the what's the French term? Rataprats, Rataponts? Rataponte, I think, is the French term. Uh, split second chronographs. So you're able to start your time on those if you're not familiar with the split second chrono. You'll start your time and then you can uh, you can push a plunger and read the time that that was where you hit the plunger for your site. You know, push it once to start, push it again. There's a hand that will show you where it was at when you've done that second push. But the chrono will continue to run this way. You can track two different times that started at the same point, but might have two different endings. So that's just it conceptually, but obviously with a mechanical movement, that's far more complicated than the traditional chronograph that most people are familiar with. Every chronograph I've ever owned is just a traditional chronograph where it starts, you can pause it and resume it. But other than that, you can't actually track two times from the same starting point. So you can't do a split second. So both of these do that. Um, the Speedmaster version, obviously, it's kind of like the Ed White Speedmaster um, very traditional looking style, obviously different in a lot of ways uh, in terms of like the dial texture, uh, the 18 karat gold that they're running with. Um, but you see the, it, it follows the Speedmaster motif. So if you're familiar with Speedmasters, you'll probably be like, oh yeah, no, that's a, I, I, I understand the look of this watch. I understand what Omega is doing here. So I think the way they got this one set up is the initial plunge, I think is right here. And I think they put the chime unit here at the sort of, um, what, what would we call that? The eight o'clock position, eight, between the eight and the nine. Now that's the other thing. So besides having the split second chronograph function, this has a chime function. Now I'm saying chime specifically and not minute repeater and not alarm. So that's probably something that we could spend a little bit of time talking about because it wasn't 
I've never owned any watches that do any of that other than like my digital G-Shock, of course, has an alarm feature, so it beeps. But when we get into the mechanical realm, I've never owned anything that makes noise. And so the on the scale of affordability, alarm watches, while more than traditional watches, are not particularly pricey. And those usually have a hand where you set a time. And once it hits, usually makes a fairly aggressive, uh, noisy alarm. Have you ever had a clock? An old, I use, even I had one of these. Of course, I am old, but um, like a wind up clock, at least a wind up for the alarm. And it just sort of rings or buzzes. Uh, Buzzing is usually what the watches do. So that's an alarm watch. And then the minute repeater is my favorite complication, actually, way too expensive for me to get. But that's where you can push a button and it allows you to know what time it is by the tones of the chimes. And depending on the complexity of the minute repeater, you could find a minute repeater that might only tell you what hour it is, or you could find the hour and minute. Um, and then in between, there are sometimes ones that will do an hour and then it'll tell you like if you're near 15, 30 or 45 minutes past the hour. So the, so those are the, uh, the typical approach. And I see Obese Tuna has joined during the live stream. So welcome Obese Tuna. References the West, West Clock's Big Ben. And so these are not minute repeaters, but the technology is very similar. And so they're calling it a chime because the chiming unit doesn't tell you what time the watch is. It tells you what time is on the chronograph. So it allows you to audibly know where you've paused your chronograph, stopped your chronograph at, which I don't know how practical that is, but it's, it's an interesting idea. And of course, this is an example of Omega flexing their complication uh, pedigree, which is something we've seen them do from time to time. I'd say the most recent one was really on the sports watch side where they did those really deep dive uh, Seamasters or those uber deep Planet Ocean watches they came out with um, to just be able to pass extreme depths that you would never be able as a person to even get to. Uh, you know, you couldn't swim down there, but you know, it was all about being the best at something. And so Omega, of course, uh, you know, yeah, and I've talked before about how I think they kind of got this multi-pronged strategy of trying to generate interest in their brand. And one of those things they like to do is show that they actually do high complication stuff, you know, say versus Rolex, which they're often compared to. And Rolex doesn't really do anything that I know of in grand complication form. Like what's the most complicated to watch Rolex makes? I think it's the Yachtmaster which is an interesting watch, but it's not exactly, I don't think we'd call it a grand complication. So anyway, so they've got two different looks here. Um, uh, here's a back shot of the 1932. Uh, very interesting, uh, you know, decorated movements. There's a lot of gold going on, which again, given the price point, which I haven't revealed yet, but spoilers, it's a lot. Um, isn't too uh, surprising to have happen here. Uh, and so the as I was talking about the, the the Speedmaster one, obviously is very inspired by the Ed Wright, uh, Ed yeah Ed White uh, Omega Speedmasters. And then the 1932 is very much taking its cues from a from a pocket watch movement. I actually like the look. I think a little bit more of the 1932. It's tough for me because as uh, longtime viewers know, I'm not a fan of when you have subdials cropping into Arabic numerals. I think it's ugly. And so I'm bothered. I know it was common on a lot of po pocket watches. So again, I'm not saying that this isn't authentic to the style. It's just not the style I care for, which is too bad because I like pocket watch numerals. I like the, the scripted font a lot of the brands went with. And Omega made a lot of pocket watches. But obviously they're cropping the 12 here and it just kind of irks me to no end. Uh, both of the versions of the watch actually show the hammers of the minute repeater, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, different spots for the uh, the chime units and stuff between the two, obviously, because the plungers are completely different oriented. You, uh, you've got this here with a 12 o'clock. Uh, and then I think this is what activates the minute repeater. Um, and that's the other one related to the chronograph. Whereas here is the minute repeater on the Speedmaster down, as we talked about, kind of that eight to nine o'clock position. And then the, your chrono functions, one's in the crown at the three, like you'd normally expect, not up at the 12, like the 1932. And then of course, you got your one that's sitting up there more like at the two o'clock position. Again, fairly standard for, for chronographs to put plungers in those positions. Though a lot of times we'll see uh, on, a, on a traditional chronograph, the center uh, crown will not actually in, have a plunger in it. It will just be for time setting functions. And then you'll often have a start pause up at the, at the two and then down at the 
four or five o'clock position, you'll usually see your second window, your second plunger to reset. Most people are familiar with that. So you can see the pricing now here on the blog to watch article, which again is linked in my description if you want to read up on these watches. So the Speedmaster iteration is $450,000 watch. And the pocket watch inspired 1932 is a little bit, a little bit less at 420,000. Now, I do have the Omega sites loaded up for both of these so we can get a better look at the watches with the official uh, photos from them. So here again is the Ed White. You can see just like the uh, pocket watch 1932 inspiration one, we are seeing these are the hammers of the movement. The hammers actually strike uh, into the case. I believe the case is the resonance not into the movement, which a lot of minute repeaters will actually have all of that built into the movement, not actually attached to the case itself. Uh, but I think they went ahead. I think the article, I can't remember if it was the blog to watch article, or uh, I think I also looked at Fratello's article on this watch, uh, discussed how it was designed to, you know, the hope was to get a better, a better, louder, clearer, crisp sound out of the minute repeaters. Because well, I mentioned at the start of this live stream that alarm watches often make this buzzing. Uh, it's it's not an attractive sound. It's a loud sound designed to make to wake you up. It's usually a fairly obnoxious buzzing tone. Uh, minute repeaters and chime units are supposed to be attractive <laughs> to the ear. You want them to sound pleasant. Now, I think for the 1932, they actually have on their site, and I'll see if my microphone pick it up, yeah, we can play this to hear the chime. I will warn you, I, I have clicked on this before and they unfortunately have a background music as well. It does not, it's not a music box, it's not play music. I wish they didn't have that, but we'll see if you, let me actually uh, cycle this to, there. Now we will capture OmniCap and moving my mic into position. So, cause it's gonna play through my computer speaker. So this way it'll, uh, we won't be doing cardioid recording, but I'll let you hear the, uh, hear the sound if it works. So hopefully that came through. So I mean, they, they've got an attractive chime sound. There we go. I'm going to put that back to normal mode. Uh, out of the, in my opinion, out of the watch. Um, and you got to see how the 1932, where the, you know, the chime function, they kind of highlighted some of that stuff and also had that nice uh, video portion where you could see how it sort of attaches to the case uh, to make the, to make the resonance. So overall, um, I, I mean, what my point would be, while this is well outside of the means of most people, even rich people who get watches often don't go to the extent of paying almost a half a million dollars. Obviously, though, it is it is beautiful. It's a beautiful piece. Uh, the what they're said they do their Sedna gold here, um, which is 18 karat. It looks great. You know that kind of rose gold color. I like both configurations. I you know overall, I think other than the cropping, I would prefer this iteration. I just think it's a uh, an interesting look. They call it the 1932 uh, Olympic 1932 because that's the pocket watch that it's sort of based on uh, you know, aesthetically. And of course, Speedmaster, the legendary, like most famed, uh, most famed model line out of Omega, makes a lot of sense that they would go with that. I mean, at this point, maybe they sell more Seamasters than Speedmasters, but I, th I still would say the Speedmaster is probably the most famous Omega. Um, I didn't see video on that one, though. They did have some interesting video. I, I, I'm going to make fun of one thing, though. Uh, again, super attractive watch. This dial with the, the star field pattern. I I always like these blue star field patterns. It, it looks really good. And you've got a lot of this, like, guilloche going on on the subdials. I mean, they put... This is a flex, right? This is... I don't mean a flex for the buyer, though. Obviously, that's true. But this is a flex for Omega. They're showing that they actually can do very artistic, very high-skilled, grand complication watch construction. Uh, because a lot of people will probably, you know, they think of Seamasters and Speedmasters and maybe Constellations and DeVilles um, with the occasional Globemaster thrown in, you know, the usual common affordable lines of watches. Uh, so this, you know, display case backs, which of course Omega does on all their brand models at this point, other than the DeVilles and Constellations might still be using closed case backs and some of their really high spec watches. But a lot of the stuff, even my 300M Seamaster has a display case back at this point. Uh, here's the part I wanted to make fun of, though. Okay. 
So I don't know how many of you who are, we don't have very many people on live, but if, and if you're watching the recording, feel free to leave a comment on this. I don't know how many of you have ever bought an Omega with box and papers, or more importantly, with box. All right, this box is, <laughs> this box is ridiculous. I mean, I get it. You're paying almost a half a million dollars, so you expect an impressive box. But here's the thing. I was looking in my, I my, in my, in my, closet in my bedroom, which is where I'm recording. I have just not the watches aren't in the boxes. I lock the watches up, but the what the what I keep all the watch boxes because I'm getting rid of the watch. I, you know, you'll, you'll get more out of it if you sell it with the, the box and papers. So I save all my boxes except for like this really low end things. Um, but even, I mean, like I have my box for Orient. I have my box for marathon. It's like the only box I don't have is uh, my Casio G-Shock box because it was just on that little, you know, the little watch ring, little plastic ring. And I honestly, I broke it when I was I, I was struggling to get the watch off. So I just snapped it and threw it away. Uh, not the watch, the holder. But you see a, a box like this. So this is huge. Uh, you know, you see the watch for scale. So this is the Speedmaster one. And you see this huge like wood box thing. But even setting this aside, as I look at my boxes of every watch I've purchased, my Omega box that came with the Seamaster 300 is massive. It is the biggest watch box I have ever received. It's so big that it's ridiculous. Like, I'm annoyed at how big it is. It doesn't fit on the shelf properly. I had, it's on its own shelf on top of all the shelves because this is this huge box. I have a hat on it, and, and it's, like, bigger than the hat. And I don't know, do... What's the biggest watch box you guys have ever experienced? Uh, because easily the Omega is way above anything else I have. My second biggest one ever is my IWC box that came with the Portuguese that I purchased recently, which is a huge watch. But the box is still significantly smaller than the Omega. Not not shockingly so, but but I mean, the Omega still wins. And then my third largest box ever uh, was my JLC box that I got with my Reverso. And then after that, they get way small. The small, some of the smallest boxes are actually Rolex. It's kind of funny when you look at Rolex. Well, I, I've wondered if that's other companies are like, well, Rolex is Rolex, so we're gonna have a better box at the very least or something. But like, I think even my Tudor box is bigger than my Rolex boxes. But um, I don't know. As I look over, it's like the well, lower end watches, like my Tissot and the Orient and and uh, my Stova and stuff. Those are all quite small boxes, but. All these, the rest of this stuff, I mean, it's like Rolex is the smallest, Tudor is a little bigger, Grand Seiko is a little bigger, and then Omega is just like, we're going to make up for everything with our box. And that's all I thought of with this is just this is this huge wood box. I, but again, I, I get it. I've seen the fancy boxes that, you know, people have shown when they get an Audemars Piguet or a, or a Patek. Um, and so I, I'm perhaps that when you're at $450,000, you just need a giant slab of carved wood to have your watch on. But I, I still find it kind of silly because once the watch is out, do people keep them in the boxes? I, I've never known anyone who actually keeps their watches in the box that came in unless they've stored it away. Like, like, uh, I stick mine in them when I'm trying to sell them. Like my Zodiac is in its box right now, locked in my safe. And until it sells, because I don't want it in my rotation anymore. So I took it out of the, you know, the display box that I keep it in normally. So anyway, that's just my thought on, on that. Uh, very beautiful watches. Very impressive. Uh, you know, Omega showing they know what they're doing. So just really, really cool. And it's getting a lot of media play. So while obviously watches this expensive aren't going to fly off the shelves, they're not going to move all that many units of these. They are pretty cool to look at. Now, speaking of pretty cool to look at, let's bring everything back down to reality, right? So with, we ain't spending four hundred thirty to four hundred fifty thousand dollars on watches. I'm not. Maybe some of you are, uh, but that that's not. I don't even put Grails in my mind in that price range. Like Grail watches for me don't go over two hundred thousand dollars, and and I'm already at that point. It's like I don't know because this is like the price of a house. I'm not sure that's right. So let's talk about Swatch. Okay, now this isn't a new announcement. But, um, you know, I did go ahead and stop by Hodinkee today, and I'm not going to play this video for you. I, I did actually start this video, and I had to stop it. It was just, I, I think it's meant to be really campy, but I at the point where the guy's, like, throwing the football, and then I don't know if he's going to run to catch his own throw or whatever, because he's gone all Super Saiyan. I don't, they didn't give him yellow hair, so I just couldn't get behind it. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm too much of a, of a of a uh, traditionalist when it comes to the uh, the powers of the Saiyans. But so anyway, 
these came out, these were announced a little while ago. Uh, what I like actually about this screen with the videos that I'm showing right now with Hodinkee, though, is it gives you a good sense of just how many different sizes they came out. Like these watches range from, I think, as small as 34 millimeters, like the uh, Mojambu watch here. Or that's the Frieza watch here, but the Mojambu is the same size. And all the way up to, I think this is 46, this the cell themed one. So Anyway, um, just so for those that don't know, Dragon Ball Z is an anime, uh, very famous one. There have been mo actually multiple, I guess, flavors, uh, iterations, or series within the world of Dragon Ball. So Dragon Ball Z is probably the most famous one. There was the original Dragon Ball. Um, I, am, I am not actually a Dragon Ball fan. Now, I have seen a good portion of Dragon Ball Z. And I've seen a lot of the recent movies because I have friends who are into the anime and I know enough about the characters like I can go to a movie and I can enjoy it because it's really silly. Uh, and actually, I prefer the movies because one problem that Dragon Ball Z had, at least, is as a series, it was really, really long because it just drugged like almost like this was common for anime where they'll if they get ahead of the manga, for example, that a lot of them are based off of and the manga still being written. They'll put in filler episodes and it's real. it gets really bloated. So anyway. My experience for any that care, which is probably none of you, was back in the day when I was in graduate school, a friend of mine actually loaned me on VHS tapes the Cell Saga, which was that big green watch, the Cell Saga from Dragon Ball Z. And it was a long series of this big fight. And so that's what this watch is representing Cell. And Frieza was another even longer section, I guess, that was earlier in the series, but I never saw it. So that was my introduction to Dragon Ball was I had I I'd come home for like Christmas break and I got these VHS tapes and then I went back to New York for school. And that's what I would do when, in downtime is I would pop in a VHS tape. And so that was my it wasn't my first introduction to anime, but it was my first introduction to Dragon Ball. And so I get where these watches are coming from. So. It's a really interesting strategy. The price point on these range from like $85, which I think the 34 millimeters go for. Most of them, I think, are $135. So you can see, uh, unfortunately, this one, which I think is a 41, uh, does not show you. It's not on the wrist, so you can't really see what the, uh, what the watch looks like. But a lot of these other shots are on wrist. So I thought that was really helpful. Again, they're, they're just meant to be fun because of this watch. Uh, cheaper than the moon swatches which, you know, got a lot of buzz. I think this will generate less hype amongst watch enthusiasts simply because this is very much targeted towards fans of the anime, whereas the Moon Swatch was very much targeted to people who wanted a Speedmaster and couldn't afford one, couldn't get the one they wanted, or, or whatever, you know, sort of a way to bring people into that iconic design. So this is the uh, this is the uh, Vegeta one. That's Goku on the on the dial, but but it's Vegeta scanning him. It's a famous scene from the anime. Uh, so uh, here's one I know a lot of my friends like is the Master Roshi. He's a side character one. That's one that's a, a 41 millimeter, I believe. Um, here's the smaller one, the Mojambu. He was another big villain in the show. Actually, he's he's like a fat character. So I at least in one of his forms. So I don't know why they made him the small watch, but. They uh, Frieza, purple guy, famous. Uh, and then I mentioned Cell before, but you can kind of see the the scale differences with with this watch just because of its size. So anyway, I just thought, okay, this is a we've seen a lot of collaborations before. I mean, there's a I think it's it's uh, Seiko that has a pretty famous Naruto collaboration. That's another anime. Uh, they had the collaboration with Street Fighter. Seiko did, which again, Street Fighter is a I think they based it on Street Fighter Five, but I was a big time, uh, I don't mean good, but I was, I played a lot of hours of Street Fighter 2 because that was a very uh, popular early uh, console generation fighting game that was back in the late 90s. So, you know, those sort of things, I think, as long as they don't get too pricey, make a lot of sense. Now, for a swatch, maybe these are a bit much. So the, okay, so the Goku earlier with him in the noodles, that is not a 41, that's a 47. Well, you really can't tell with this Funko Pop. Um, so that's what they've written up here on Hodinki. So, uh, and this uses that bio ceramic, which by all accounts I've heard from everyone is a, um, is a form of plastic. Now, when I went to the swatch site, this wasn't in the Hodinki article. And the, and the last time I went to the swatch site, they didn't show this Shinron watch. So this must be new. 
because uh, it was not there when I looked uh, last month, or maybe it was two months ago at this point. I lose track. So uh, Shenron was the dragon that granted the wishes in uh, Dragon Ball Z for anyone who cares. Uh, a little easier. It's got some Arabic numerals. This one actually looks like you can kind of tell the time, which some of these other ones, I'm, I'm not quite sure. You know, your ability to generally the swatch movements are not serviceable, but they are designed to allow you to change the battery, of course, because that's generally what goes wrong with them. I'm not quite sure what the uh, sizing on this one is. It looks like it's another 47 to me, but I don't, you know, I don't know if it actually, I went to the site earlier and I was like, where does it say the size of the watch? I, I don't see it. I think that's weird. Let's watch what's going on. Come on, guys. I mean, it's kind of like the most important. I mean, maybe lug to lug is the most important thing, but none like none of them ever tell you the lug to lug. But okay, there we go. I got to click on the ruler. All right. Uh, so 12 millimeters thick. Okay, it's not it's not thin, but it's not humongous. But yeah, okay, 47. Wow. All right. Well, all right. So I got sizes for everyone from little teeny wrists to big beefy wrists. So uh, it's just one of those things. So um, not my, uh, you know, probably not one I would go after myself, but I thought it was a, it was a fun one to talk about briefly just so, uh, to have an excuse to do is that, or I was going to talk about a, a brigade that I thought after talking about the Omega, I didn't want to talk about another dress watch. So it's just, it's just one of those speaking of dress watches for once, I'm not wearing one. I've been putting on dress watches for a lot of days lately because I've had so many meetings and I had a conference and that's kind of like one of the opportunities where I break out the dress watches. So today I'm actually wearing a Mr. Jones watch. This is the Step Right Up uh, limited 100 piece run. They never did a full run on, uh, 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 they never put this in the permanent collection, unfortunately. It is quartz powered, uh, kind of a uh, shooting gallery uh, themed carnival style watch designed by Ryan Clater, who designed the Ricochet pinball watch, which was actually the first watch I got. This was the first one he designed, uh, but this was a gift because it was, Sold out by the time I knew about it. Uh, Ricochet ended up in the permanent collection. This one did not. But yeah, I have. Uh, I had conf I had work conferences last week, so it's like finally had opportunities to break out the reverse, so break out the Portuguese. Uh, I think I wore one of the my little Rolex one day. Uh, that's not really a just watch, but I only have so many. So, um, so those are the main news items. So I mean, if anyone in the chat wants us to discuss anything, obviously we still have some time. We do so. I was all, I didn't expect this one to be very long. I figured somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour. Uh, in terms of some updates, I didn't actually op uh, open with any. So uh, my Ming is gone now. I finally, I, I was not able to sell it. I, I had offers, but they were, they were ridiculously low, but I did use it as trade bait for a new watch. So I'll go ahead and reveal here. I am getting a, a Santos 100, one of the, I wasn't sure if I wanted a large one or not, uh, but after having other watches that were under 52 millimeters lug to lug, I thought, all right, we'll try it. We'll try it as a as a sporty square watch because I obviously already have a dress watch with the reverse, so that's that's elegant. Uh, though it is a longer lug to lug one as well. It's not over 50 millimeters or anything. So uh, probably have that next week, and then of course uh, my plan will be to do a review on that. And that's really all I I'm working on right now. Other than as I mentioned, my attempt to uh, to unload the Zodiac because I kind of have too many, in my view, I have too many dive watches at this point. So that's why like, I like the Zodiac just fine. It's just after getting the Omega Seamaster and I have the Orient Cano now, and I still have my Tudor Black Bay Bronze. It's kind of like, I think three dive watches for someone who doesn't dive and lives in landlocked Kansas is probably sufficient. I know a lot of people just love dive watches, but I've never been super drawn to them. So I think three is enough. I don't think I need four. And so the Zodiac would, is the one that just doesn't have, it's just not in my rotation enough. So um, I did try and use it as trade bait to, to help get like that Santos. And I, I contacted two different, um, two different watch dealers that had models I was interested in. And both of them were like, we don't, we won't take Zodiac. So one of them was, they, got, they actually called Zodiac a micro brand, which I thought was adorably funny. Um, and I guess they, I, they kind of are not, I mean, I normally think of a micro brand as someplace that sells under a thousand watches a year. I've heard from a Zodiac rep, they, they sell more than that, but not a lot. I mean, they're more like 3000 watches a year. So they are really small, but they're owned by Fossil, which is a huge you know, watch empire. Uh, and then the other company, I, I think it was more of a Zodiac was just a little too low end for them. Like they just don't, they just said they just don't deal in it. So 
they also know they don't deal a lot in Ming, but um, but they can. They said they know there are enough private collectors that contact them for Ming's, and that was my Ming Messina collab. So, um, so it's it's one of those things. I see Ob says thinks it's a great choice. Well, I, I hope so. I hope I like it. Um, so obviously the Santos one uh, hundreds are discontinued. Uh, they've been replaced for a few years now. So. I, I've not handled one, but um, but I'm looking forward to giving. So of course, I hate it. I'll you know I'll trade it or sell it and find something different. It's not a big deal. Nice thing about watches versus pinball machines is it's super easy to ship them. So so it's easy to have a, a wider audience to uh, to do. I've shipped a couple of pinball machines. It is a huge pain. Um, even they come in saying they'll do all of the stuff, and then they don't like they don't do anything to protect it. And I feel obligated to strap down the the head and stuff. It's anyway, that's the whole thing that we don't need to go into here. But speaking of pinball, I see we have a comment from Scotty Pinball. So uh, welcome to the stream. He asks a question: When do you think the SWAT that Swatch will catch up with demand on the Moon watches? Uh, I would think within twelve months. That's my guess. The only issue at this point that I would imagine is whether or not there's a production issue. Like, are they having trouble getting uh, their supply of bioceramic or an ingredient that they use to make the bioceramic? Those sort of barriers, barriers to production, I think are the only reason why they wouldn't be able to catch up at this point. Um, and so that's why I'll go ahead and say within a year, because I think I'm giving them reasonable padding. I have been reading online, though, this is sporadic, because I don't really follow Moonswatch threads actively anymore, that People are getting calls or being notified of, yeah, the, there's more stock coming in. There's people are able to, you still have to show up and be in line and buy them. And of course, Swatch, uh, uh, their CEO, I can't remember, is the CEO of the Swatch Group. I think it was, but it might have been the C, it might have been the head of just the brand Swatch, you know, one of, one of the two. They're both high level people, but had indicated that they were planning to do some like, both expanding the number of boutiques that carry the watch because there are like sh swatch shops, I guess, in certain airports and such that that were not a part of the initial allocations. So there was a plan to go ahead and add those to the allocations. And then in addition to that, also doing some, it sounded like mobile things. I'm not, I wasn't clear. They're like pop-up shops or like we're thinking, I'm thinking probably wrongly, like the Oscar Mayer Wiener Mobile, which is going around with Swatch branding on it. Maybe it looks like a watch instead of a hot dog. I don't know. And then they, you know, they're kind of like selling from the truck sort of thing. I think they have not indicated this, obviously, but, you know, back when they first announced that they were going to do this, they were going to do the uh, Moon Swatch. It was supposed to be sold online. And then I think what, and I've commented on this before, but I, I remain convinced that Swatch saw that this really helped the boutiques get business and they're trying to, for whatever reason, sustain their brick and mortar boutiques instead of moving online or whatever. I don't, and I, you know, we can pass our judgments however we want on that. So they're using this as a vehicle to drive people into going to the Swatch stores to pick up these watches. I personally think that when the sales slow enough and they will slow because these are not limited Swatch, I don't think is doing anything to try and throttle the supply. They want to sell as many of these as they can. I think they will actually end up selling these online. I know after the first month where they got real cagey about it, they started saying, no, we're not going to sell these online. We're going to do the, like the Wiener Mobile thing and we're going to expand the number of boutiques. When this slows enough, I think they just say, you know what, we got to sell it online. We'll keep it in production and let's just sell them because no one's flipping them anymore. And money is money and they're not driving people to the shops anymore because everyone who desperately wanted one already got one. So why wouldn't you throw it online at that point? I think they should have thrown it online in the first place, uh, but they didn't. Uh, and if it's helped their boutiques out, it may have it fed their strategy. Well, uh, I've heard from, again, from Swatch, and this was months ago, that they said they saw an uptick in Speedmaster sales, like a 50% uptick, and they were really crediting this, which is something I thought would be a lot slower burn, that people who would buy the Moon Swatch becoming Speedmaster buyers of the Moon Watch would, I could conceive it happening, but I thought they would like have to ramp up their income, you know, be like, you get the 21-year-old who buys the Moon Swatch, and then when he's a 31-year-old, he goes, you know what, I'm I'm comfortable enough now. I can I can afford to get a moon watch. But apparently, a lot of people just got convinced or whatever, or at least that's the theory 
that it's time to buy because they saw it and maybe it rekindled or rekindled their passion for it. Or maybe they didn't know about the Speedmaster and they saw the Swatch version and then they realized there was a luxury version and they're just like, oh, wow, that's cool. I'd rather have one that's not made out of plastic. Um, I was, when I saw the announcement of the Moon Swatch, I was really interested in like getting the Pluto edition. I thought it was a really cool look. I've seen too many people show broken ones at this point to want it. I, I, you know, I get that it's a cheap watch, but I don't want it to fall apart. And too many people have had bad experiences. And the strap itself looked horrible, even in the stock photos. It looked bad, like uncomfortable. So it's like I knew I'd have to change the strap, which again is not a big deal. But if the watch is also falling apart and I don't want to wear it on the straps, I'm going to spend, you know, I don't know, thirty dollars to get a strap, a NATO for it or whatever. I was just like, you know what? I let's let's wear an Orient instead and and do that. Granted, I didn't buy that. That was a birthday gift, but 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 I'll be like, hey, put it on the list and be like, hey, this is this is almost the same price as a moon swatch and it's gonna hold up. So so it's it's more of that sort of thing. So so uh back to uh future plans. Now in November, we're almost in November, obviously. I think it was, I can't remember when in November, I'm almost positive last November is when I did a state of the collection. And I know some YouTube channels do multiple states of the collection, like in a year, like in a calendar year, they do more than one, which maybe you move a lot of product that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but my plan had always been to wait a year before, before I would do it. And thinking back on what I remember from that one, because I, I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's only 12 months ago, Dennis, but it it's not the years guys it's the mileage um i think i've had a lot of changes even though i haven't really picked up a lot of watches this year in fact uh, it hasn't been until the last couple of months that we've i've seen a lot of movement so i think this year uh early in the year i got my tso prx and then i had a huge lull with no no watch activity i mean obviously doing content but no like buying and selling stuff uh and then i got the omega and then I got uh, the Portuguese, I got the Orient, and then the Santos will come in time for the for the SOTC. So I'm planning to do that. And then I'm trying to think what all's gone. I had a lot that left a little bit just shortly after the last SOTC. Like I had my my rotary diver left, my chronograph from Hamilton left. I, um, I'm trying to think. I've had my TSO 1926 leave this year. The Ming's gone now. Uh, Zodiac, I wouldn't include even if it hasn't sold yet because I'm trying to sell it. So I don't consider it a part of the collection anymore. It's just isolated in a box on Chrono 24. So um, so I'm thinking that'll probably be the big video uh, next month. Other than I, I'll do a Santos review, of course. It would be my plan after about a week of wearing it probably. So, and that's about it. Because I think I've, other maybe this, other than this watch, I've reviewed every watch I own. Um, which maybe I should go ahead. I mean, I'm, I've got plenty of time on this now. I could review this one. It's just, it's so limited and they didn't mainline the production. I, you know, it's like, I don't know how many people want to watch a review of a watch they made a hundred units of and can't find anywhere. It's kind of pointless. I also didn't do a review of my, um, my, uh, watch. Oh yeah. That I got early this year is it was a gift as well for Christmas, but it, it didn't come till January, which was the, um, Oh, what is it called? Oh, my Spear Agnew watch from Dirty Time Company. Uh, so I didn't do a review video of that, but I did a history of that watch because it's a really, and if you haven't seen that video, most people haven't because it's one of my least viewed videos. It's actually one of my better researched ones. So we actually go into the history of how that watch was developed because it's like, why is Spear Agnew on a watch? When I first saw them, I thought it was a campaign gimmick. Like they used to give out buttons during camp political campaigns. I thought, Maybe watches were cheap. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't figure it out because I was like, watch seems like an expensive gimme. Like doing pins, ink pins or pins, lapel pins uh, and stuff. That makes sense. But I, who gives a watch? I, it seems too expensive. Even a cheap watch seems too expensive. And no, it wasn't a campaign thing. It was making fun of him. And there was a, there was a whole thing about it from the late 60s, apparently. So, so I did a video on that instead of doing a review because, again, I was like, Finding a Spear Agnew watch is not actually very hard and they're not worth very much money, but they usually aren't working because they're pin lever escapements. And uh, it's just it's such an old, wa a wa an old watch. It would be challenging to find one running in decent condition. So it's kind of like eh, the review. A review is not helpful, is my thought. So I thought a history video would be more fun. So anyway, um, that's it. And those are the upcoming plans. I'll, you know, I'll probably do some more live streams here. Oh, 
here's something people can leave comments uh, comments in the comment section for. I do need new ideas for my next this or that. So I, I do want to do another this or that in November. Uh, last one we did was in early October, I think. Maybe it was late September. This month was a was a mess, total mess for me. Uh, I'm amazed I put any videos out. <laughs> I've just had a lot of work stuff that comes together in October, uh, annual meeting stuff and, and 2023 planning, like budgets and all of that. I'm through most of that work now, though. So so the next two months of the year actually should be fairly calm until the legislative session starts, which is mid-January. So what I'm saying is I have time to do stuff again. And so I would like to do another this or that. I would like watch suggestions from people. You don't need to tell me like, which two to match up. If you want to just say, I'd like a video on this watch, I can find a matchup for it or someone else might suggest a matchup for it. But if you have thoughts on matchup watches uh, to do in a this or that, uh, let me know. It saves me some work because otherwise I go in blind, just kind of, I mean, obviously I know a lot of watches, but I'll find one and then I try and find something of roughly equivalent value and, you know, move forward from there. So, but I'd like to cover ones that people are interested in covering. So uh, and I haven't put out a call for that in a while. So feel free to leave a comment in the recorded version of this video. If you have particular watches, or you can always email watches with Dennis at gmail.com and, and send me some people do it that way and just send me emails. And yes, uh, so as a beast tune is known, novelty watches can be quite interesting. Yeah. And that's where, again, because this is a novelty watch as well, it's part of the reason I haven't mostly because of the limited factor, because I did review the Ricochet watch, but I have three, what I think of as novelties, which are just fun watches, kind of like how the Dragon Ball watches are novelty watches. So obviously I have the Step Right Up watch here, the Ricochet pinball watch, and my Spiro Agnew watch. Those are my three fun watches. And I'm wearing this today because I've spent so long not getting to wear my fun watches because I've been going to too many work events. That's like, I'm wearing a fun watch today. And then I thought I'm going to wear one tomorrow. And then I remembered I have a Medicaid meeting, so I will be probably wearing a dress watch. But that's okay. I've got some in the box that still need some love. But uh, that'll be it for this live stream. Thanks so much for all of you who were able to catch it live. For those of you who couldn't, I hope you enjoyed it in the pre-recorded version. And I will talk to you all next time. Take care, everybody.